Good morning. Thank you. It is um, a pleasure to be here. Thank you for, uh, for the opportunity to uh, share just a, a few minutes with you. And I want to tell you that it's true. I'm a simple country chemist. I'm a beakers and flask guy that makes new chemicals, makes new molecules, creates things that have never been created before. And I love being a scientist because I love being astounded. I love being astounded by discoveries and realizations and new things that have never been seen by people. But that's not why I went into chemistry. So why did you go into chemistry, you say? Because I didn't like the way things were. So when I was sitting in the same chairs that you are, the, uh, the air wasn't too easy to breathe. They used to say this, uh, this old saying about, you know, back when the Environmental Protection Agency was founded, the air was so polluted that the people of Denver wanted to see the mountains again. The people of Los Angeles wanted to see each other again. <laughs> it's not unlike uh, uh, China is, is today. And the reason that today is different from it was years ago is because people designed it to be different. People didn't accept things the way they were. The reason that you can go outside and breathe the air without coughing and gag, and the reason that you can swim in your beach is because people designed things to be different. People designed a sustainable future that is today. Now, is today where we need to be? I'm going to tell you I don't think so. But I'm also going to tell you that I'm the most optimistic person in almost any room that I go in. Because I recognize that we can design things to be different. We have designed things to be different. And as a chemist, I know one thing to be true. I know that all we have in this world is energy and matter. Energy and material. And green chemistry, designing those molecules to be more sustainable, is all about not just redesigning all of that matter, but all of the matter that's used to generate, store, and transport our energy. So let's step back. Now, I have very little patience for pessimism. I have very little patience for people who talk about the negative and say things are impossible and this is bad and that's bad. But I'm going to give you just a little glimpse of where we are. This might look to, to you like an, an abstract painting. Maybe it's, maybe it's in the uh, National Museum. But if we zoom in, we realize that, hmm, no, that's the 60,000 plastic bags that are used every five seconds in the US. What about this? That, is that a rocky beach, sandy beach? No, definitely rocky. No, hold on. That's actually the 426,000 cell phones that are disposed of every day in the US. And I lose so many cell phones, those of you who know me, the, those six in the middle, those are mine. That's terrible. Okay, let's see, landscape, moonscape, let's zoom in. Those would be the two million plastic beverage bottles that are disposed uh, every five minutes in the US. So people dedicated their lives to making the air, land, and water cleaner over the decades. But sometimes, and this is important to remember because we're talking about design, that you have to be thoughtful about how you design or you could do the right things, yet do them wrong. What do I mean by that? How many people here have played the game whack-a-mole at a carnival? Don't lie, you all have. You all have. We all know it. I have. You have. So, but if you look at the issues around pollution, the planet, and you look at them in a fragmented way, water, toxics, energy, climate, biodiversity, then it's playing whack-a-mole. You, you're dealing with one problem while another one pops up, and you need to understand that all of these things are interconnected. Otherwise, you wind up doing things like inventing biofuels. Wonderful, we want to get fuels from renewable resources and wind up doing it in a way that competes with food, feed, and land use options. Doing the right thing, making renewable fuels. 
doing them in the wrong way, perhaps. Purifying water with acutely lethal substances like chlorine. Purifying our water, yes. Using acutely lethal, deadly substances, probably not so good. Renewable energy through capturing the power of the sun. But if those photovoltaic cells are made from acutely toxic, persistent, rare metals, are you doing the right thing, but doing it in an unsustainable way? Uh, increasing our crop efficiency, but using pesticides that are persistent bioaccumulative and get into our, our groundwater. Getting energy saving lights, but you do it with mercury, which is a neurotoxin that, that's used in the manufacturing at the end of life. Doing the right things, but maybe doing them wrong. So how did we get here? Was it some kind of conspiracy? To say, ha ha, I'll get those environmentalist people. No, of course not. These were urgent and necessary goals. People by the millions die from, from infected water. People by the millions starve because of inadequate food. The energy crisis and the energy prices um, are real challenges. People with noble goals, best of intentions, brought to bear creativity, but they did it in a fragmented way without understanding that all of these things are interconnected and we need to think about things in terms of systems in order to get the right answers. So, this is one of my favorite cartoons. People are bailing out the boat and the folks at the other end said, I'm sure glad the hole isn't in our end of the boat. So the message from this is twofold. One, we only have one boat, and two, we're all in the same boat. So thinking in terms of interconnected systems. And it all comes back to Einstein. Doesn't it always come back to Einstein? Problems can't be solved at the same level of awareness that created them. You have to think differently. You have to think inventively. You have to take a new pair of eyes. And so some of this is about green chemistry. I'm not going to go down into uh, the specifics of green chemistry because quite frankly it would take me probably a whole academic semester to do that. But it's about designing things so you don't use or generate hazardous substances. Now this is not an eye chart and I will not read this to you, but it's a design framework for how you design everything from the clothes you're wearing to the way that we go about generating our energy, our transportation, our computers, and on and on. Everything that we see, touch, and feel so that it's actually not toxic, not degrading, it's healthy. So when we make adhesives, things that glue things together, how do we do that? We have these very reactive, very toxic starting materials. We put all kinds of additives into, into these things. That's really not how nature does it. How many people have gone down to the ocean and ever tried to pull like a, a, a mussel or, or a clam off a rock? Anybody? Is it easy? No. No, it's not. And that is not using the same types of materials that we use industrially. It uses very low concentrations. It's doing this at, at room temperatures and, uh, and with benign starting materials. So I was redoing a bathroom recently. I was redoing a bathroom and scraping up the tiles. And when you scrape up the tiles and I'm scraping my knuckles and my knuckles are bleeding and I'm very upset. And then I started to, right before, I uh, started feeling woozy. And when I woke up, I read this little label on that can and it said, only use in a well-ventilated area. If you don't, it will be bad. And I started thinking, this isn't the, the way nature goes about making glues and adhesives. Now that slide's not upside down, that's the gecko. Now, who wants to tell me how the, what glue, what chemical glue that, that gecko stuck on its feet in order to, any glue? No glue. It uses millions of submicron keratin fibers to create weak force interaction so it can stick there. Does it have to scrape its feet up? No, it picks them up and walks and walks and walks. So is this one of these greeny products? No. I take the lessons from nature and make something called gecko tape. That's a Spider-Man model with a square centimeter of gecko tape. 3M made it. It can go on and off and on and off. This isn't one of those greeny products that costs more and doesn't work as well. This is about su superior performance, as nature often gives us. So this is how we make high-tech ceramics in, uh, in industry. It's called heat-beaten treat. 
you uh, beat the clay to the proper consistency, heat at 3,000 degrees for about 50 hours. How many people in the audience have bones? Okay, I do too. Yep, I have bones. Uh, mine, are, mine are pretty hard. Okay. How many been, people here have been heated in an oven at 3,000 degrees for 50 hours? Yeah, what's my point? My point is getting the performance that you want doesn't require these environmentally r ridiculous steps. Instead, you learn from nature. How do you set down protein templates in order to get molecular self-assembly to, to get this? Because this is the way that the abalone does it. It's as good as our high-tech ceramics, but he's like a metal under stress, and that's the abalone ceramics factory. Ambient temperatures and pressures dilute feedstocks, non-toxic, and it does it underwater just to show off. So we, w we might want to think about how do you engage in innovation? There's a concept called ideality. How do you get all of the performance of a product without the product existing itself? What? What did he just say? It's not that crazy. Most of us um, uh, of a certain age grew up with telephone wires stringing along the, the streets, and most of us have these, uh, these phones in our pockets, getting all of the performance of the telephone wires without the telephone wires needing to exist, right? So that's ideality. What does that mean for us? Instead of decaffeinating coffee um, by using methylene chloride, which is a cancer suspect agent, instead of doing that, we decaffeinate it with liquid carbon dioxide. That's an incremental improvement. What's the transformative innovation? Coffee beans growing without caffeine. These are natural hybrids in Hawaii. That's the leapfrog innovation. What about dyes? We know that some dyes, the manufacturing, the dyes themselves can be toxic. What about having cotton that's naturally colored without any dyes? Instead of waterproofing things by putting a whole bunch of chemicals, or water resistant, perfluorinated things, we look at the lotus leaf. And the lotus leaf tells us, hmm, we can do this not with, not with chemical applications, but with geometry to repel the water. So what does the future look like? I have no idea, and neither do you. And that's why it's so exciting. That's why it's so astounding, because the future is gonna look like what you, des what you design it to look like, what we design it to look like collectively. Let me introduce you to Jamie Edwards. Jamie Edwards built a nuclear fusion reactor for his science fair project at the age of 13. He built it at the age of 13, becoming the youngest person ever to build a functioning nuclear fusion reactor. He beat out Taylor Wilson, who a year or two before had built it at the age of 14, and went on to, or, or a few years before, he went on to build uh, a prototype, nuclear fusion react reactor prototype that is being funded by the Department of Energy to the tune of millions of dollars. So you might be sitting there saying, you know, maybe someday, no. Not someday. These days, these days, every one of you is getting the tools. You're getting the toolbox that you need in order to design tomorrow. It's not someday. We are the leaders we've been waiting for. At the beginning of this talk, I told you that I know, as a chemist, that all we have is matter and energy and all of you know that. I lied. The reason that I'm the most optimistic person in any room is because I know that it's not just about matter and energy. It's about spirit, it's about commitment, it's about creativity, it's about innovation. It's about the human things that we bring to this equation of matter and energy that's going to design tomorrow to be different than today. Robert F. Kennedy Jr. used to like to say, some see the world as it is and ask why, others dream of a world as it could be and ask why not. Why not? Thank you very much.